Hello, I'm Rebecca Olds. Welcome back to my studio here at Time Smith Dress History. A few years ago, I made a video about drafting a stays pattern using the ARC method that was published in Patterns of Fashion 5 and uh, developed by Luca Costigliolo for the School of Historical Dress, who published that book. In today's video, this is part one of a three-part series that not only shows you what I'm doing, but explains how I'm doing it and why I'm doing it. It is the same style of stays, the 1760s strapless, fully boned stays that are in Patterns of Fashion 5, uh, project number 24 on pages 100 to 103. For this draft that I'm doing, I took the measurements over my friend Sarah, uh, who was already wearing a pair of stays that she had made um, that fit her fairly well, uh, but they're of a later style, the Augusta stays that are kind of 1775 to 1790 approximately. I took Sarah's measurements using a physical measure, not a measuring tape, like this with numbers on it in increments like an inch or a centimeter, but rather a physical measure using a strip of paper with no markings whatsoever on it until I mark the measurement that I've taken. This is the kind of measuring system that was used in the 18th century by tailors and staymakers for pattern drafting. Uh, it involves getting a physical measure. Now in the period, they would mark the measurements taken uh, by using a pair of scissors and snip into the paper in various ways to create different uh, codes indicating whether it was a length that they were taking or a, a, a circumference or whether it was a part of the body or whether it was a limb, arm or leg. I did not do that in this case. I used a pencil to actually mark where I'd taken the measure and then an identification of what measure it was that I was taking. So you'll see me using this tape in this series of videos as I go about drafting the pattern. Now this draft took me approximately perhaps four hours to draft, split over two days uh, from beginning to end, including all of the, the converting of the master pattern into separate pieces that could be laid out and cut out on fabrics. I've split that into three. So this is part one of a three part series, so three videos in, in total. And I've I'd taken a pretty light approach to editing so that you get a sense of uh, the time it takes and the flow. Um, and some of that is sort of mental. You can see me kind of thinking and musing out loud uh, about the, the process that I'm uh, doing. That does mean that each of these videos is a bit longer than the YouTube algorithm likes. And I say two fingers up to the algorithm, but you may want to uh, save these videos uh, if you don't have time to watch them beginning to end in one sitting. Uh, save them to a playlist or to your watch later uh, playlist um, so that you can come back and finish it at a time that's convenient for you. I do appreciate it. they're quite long. Uh, I will also add to the description below um, kind of chapters that you can click through to specific sections, partic particular parts of a video that you want to go back and watch over or to pick up where you left off the last time that you were watching. So I hope that's helpful. At various points during these videos, I talk about uh, how stays should feel and how they should fit and where they sit on the body. So I hope that's helpful in your own projects. I also talk about adjustability and the sizing and sh uh, of your stays. Um, it's pretty common these days to use the width of the lacing gap in the back of the stays to account for weight gain or weight loss. I don't think that's the way it was done in the period from my studies and experimentation. So I will talk about what I think would work better than that. And the spoiler alert is I don't think it was the back lacing gap. Now part one, I'll forewarn you, ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger, but don't worry, part two picks right up where that left off. So hang in there, all will be revealed as we go along. So without further ado, we'll get straight into it. Uh, part one, uh, which is really drafting the, the basic block for the stays, determining the length and the circumferences and the basic, the basic size and shape that these stays are going to take. Okay, the first thing needed is this vertical line. This is basically the frame reference that everything else up and down, front to back, will be measured with reference to that line. Now, when working with your piece of paper, Make sure that it's large enough. Remember, it only needs to be hard, large enough to map half the body from the center front to the center back. When you put in that um, vertical line, bear in mind that part of the stays as they get patterned are going to swoop up this way on the back and they're going to extend to the front 
more so than at the back that in apportioning the the um, kind of volume of the body that kind of midpoint that midline um, you know roughly running through directly into the underarm that there's going to be more of the body uh, the mass of the torso uh, towards the the front of the body than to the back so bearing uh, bearing that in mind you may choose to position that vertical line just a little bit right of center and you want to make sure that you've got enough at the bottom and that will then give you scope for for drafting the back um, to extend up this way so i'm going to have more of this line than i actually need showing here at the top we'll go ahead and get that right down to the bottom The next step is to map on the underarm measurement. It is a length measurement. Uh, so on a uh, period drafting tape, um, it would um, be marked a certain way. I've actually done this with drawing a line so that there's no doubt um, uh, and no one has to interpret a key of the symbols cut into the paper tape. So AM is the line, the length line, uh, a vertical line from the underarm to the waist. Uh, I am going to place the waist more or less halfway along here so that I've got room to work with above the waist and below the waist. So let's just go here. I don't exactly know how long that line is that I'm going to need so I'm going to extend it very generously just in case right. so that we're going to uh, refer to as the waist so measuring up from that to the notch at the top of the tape and I line that up comes to here that will now be the underarm and I will try not to obscure this too much with my head as I get in there and line that up okay now as noted in patterns of fashion five that is the top of the underarm and proportionately then where the bust line falls is um, relatively low from that top point towards the waist. If you look on page 155, it uses smooth covered staves from an earlier period um, as a point of comparison, a garment for comparison, noting that 18th century says, especially this style from the 1760s, does sit quite high up under the arm. So I'm going to want to be careful that I don't end up with the bust line drawn too high. Okay, we have a slight um, hiccup here in that one of the measurements that I'm sure I took, um, it's not marked on the tape. However, this is not absolutely essential in this particular case because I measured uh, over stays that already fit, that she has that fit well, stays that are for a slightly later era um, so we're we're doing we're doing a bit of time traveling here. In the period, it would not have been unusual for a, a stay maker um, to be taking measurements over uh, a customer's current pair of stays, um, with a view to making stays for newer uh, style of stays. So, uh, a woman who had been wearing uh, fully boned strapless stays of the 1760s and into the 70s and then as the uh, the silhouette began to change she might be wearing that pair of fully bone stays while being measured for the newer style um, a little bit softer uh, with a little bit more pronounced um, bust shape in this case we're working from the reverse um, uh, however fortunately um, the pair of later period stays uh, which are from the Augusta pattern um, were being worn uh, fairly, fairly straight front, uh, not a great deal of so-called um, thrust. So um, 
I think from that, the fact that I took these measurements over stays that already had her, her breast tissue in a somewhat compressed and supported position, that I can take an educated guess uh, based on my experience on where that natural bust line would be without, without being shaped or manipulated by a later style of stays. So I'm going to uh, calculate this measurement of AP, which is defined as the length from the bust, uh, at bust level, so somewhere on this line, uh, from the bust level to the waist. So you would take that AP measurement, starting from the waist, and ideally have a mark on your tape to measure up to find AP. Now, the proportions uh, of the stays pattern on page 155 in Patterns of Fashion 5, it looks like on that pattern that the uh, bust line is found at a little higher than one third of this total line. So I'm going to very quickly determine what the thirds are going to be of this line. Uh, it comes out almost exactly eight inches. So we are looking at perhaps two and a half. Let's see, yeah, two and a half, two and a half is seven and a half times three. So actually that will work very nicely at um, two and a half will be just a bit higher from a, a, a distance measuring a third of this total distance. So we'll go with that. Um, I think that is a fairly safe um, guesstimate based on having seen uh, this customer in her later stays that do uh, pretty much put her body um, in a very similar uh, sort of uh, supported shape as these stays need to. So we will call that bust line. The next step then is to make that apportionment of uh, the mass or, or, or uh, size of the body between the front and the back. One of the measurements uh, crucial for determining that is a measurement that's taken across the front of the bust from underarm to underarm. Uh, because obviously half of that will then be, should be the center front. So I have here uh, the whole of AD is across the entire um, front of the body from underarm to underarm, um, which as you can imagine will be bigger than if I had taken that same underarm to underarm from the back. So we have AD as a whole marking here as having been taken across uh, the front. Um, and to the underarms, and we need that in half. And I believe I have already made that calculation and put it here. Uh, it looks like that I may have mistakenly made that calculation from the end of the tape, which is not correct. Yeah, I did in fact do that, right. So it needs to be here to there. So this is AD. And as you can see, um, sometimes mistakes are made, but logic can prevail in helping work out exactly what was intended. So here is the correct AD. And that is the apportionment along the bust, along that bust line to find the center front and it is here. So then we know from taking her entire bust circumference and then you take half of that and that should give you your center front to your center back. Now that's bearing in mind that that measurement was taken in stays. So as a backup and a little bit of a sense check I also um, took a measurement with of um, the waist and bust areas without stays on to see how that affects this apportionment. And what we find here is that the midpoint vertical line here uh, along the bust from that to her center back is this. And that um, corrects any um, uh, distortion 
um, of these measurements that uh, may have occurred uh, when taking measurements with her already wearing stays. So we should find that this, let's see, that is half, uh, seven eighths, eight and seven eighths inches. And this is almost exactly the same, which gives, does confirm just how much bust compression um, the stays she has in those stays. Um, I need to have a think on how I wish to address that. Uh, but meanwhile, I will also capture um, the, I'll double check, that's from that notch to that, yes it is. What we have here will be from her, on her waist, from that midline to the back. So we can see that this is going to be, based on her natural measurements, um, pretty realistic for um, a back line, a center back line. And I am pretty happy with that, um, knowing um, the amount of sort of waist reduction uh, that she um, has in her current stays. So the next measurement I need to look at is uh, to try to determine the center front point on her waist. Her half waist is this, so that's her total half waist, and we know what that we can put that there and that here. And as I suspect that she's got quite a lot of reduction in these old stays, we are looking at that six and a quarter. Yeah, she's got a lot of waist reduction going on here. I think because this style of stays is going to require uh, uh, darts and curved seams, um, we need to account for just how much reduction she is getting. Um, bearing in mind that her body inside stays is smaller circumference than taking measurements over the entire circumference of her body plus stays that layer. So of course the circumference measures that I'm working with, um, her body inside is already smaller than the measurements I have because my measurements are taken around the stays as well. Then accounting for the level of reduction, she's quite squishy um, and she's got very good support in those. So I think that it is entirely realistic to add at least one inch to the front part of the body, that the back, having done that, checked that both in stays and without stays on, I'm pretty happy with how that is playing out on paper, but I think her natural body, if I had taken a full set of measurements with a view to a fresh pattern draft with no reference or comparison to other stays, I think that these measurements would be sitting further this way. One other factor in this is that stays when worn and where the parts of the stays need to coincide with parts of the body, the center back is drafted with minimal, if any, lacing gap. I know that it's commonly said that you want a two inch lacing gap. However, the moment you're playing with those pattern pieces, as we see in the extants and in images, the moment we introduce a, a bigger gap with changing of weight, seems to be the rationale behind uh, uh, people who uh, feel there should be a large lacing gap, then that piece begins to sit over a part of the body, in particular the flanks, over the high hip, uh, around on the back, that is extremely uncomfortable, if not outright painful. Using a lacing gap at the back, or to a lesser degree at the front, but the back in particular, if that's going to vary much, then that is going to affect where the stays sit on your body in a way that introduces a huge risk of pain. What we see in images is little to no lacing gap in the back. 
uh, I know that that raises the question, well, how did people continue wearing uh, one set of stays with fluctuations in weight? I think there's a lot to be said for how the darts in the seams uh, that achieve the waist reduction, um, they're not uniformly done. Uh, the darts are different shaped on each seam. Uh, and I think that's where the uh, variation, um, the forgiveness in the stays um, are going to work for you. And if someone um, was going to have a lot of uh, weight fluctuations and needed to keep those pair of stays, for example, if they gained a lot of weight or for whatever reason could not have a, pair, a new pair of stays patterned, um, it makes a lot more sense to me to split a seam that is along the um, side of the body and side lacing. We do have surviving stays from the period uh, where that has been done. Um, it's usually assumed that that was for the sake of maternity um, and a swelling belly, but that would also be very sensible for just general weight gain. And then subsequent perhaps, you know, weight loss as well, that the, the lacing can be brought back in. But having worn stays uh, day after day, long days in an 18th century setting in a museum, I can vouch for the fact that this panel that's going to be drawn on the back needs to stay exactly there. If I were needing to um, let out my stays in some way, I'd be going for probably the seam between pieces two and three. Um, I should have this in front. I'm talking about this, this, por this seam. This seam can be let out a little bit uh, or split open and close with lacing and somewhat on this one. Um, but I would not introduce that here or here. Uh, that's my view. I would, I would love an opportunity to, to, to put that to the test, but frankly, there are not enough women wearing historical stays in historical settings, uh, leading a life and activities in the same way as our ancestresses did in the 18th century for me to, to basically have a pool of people to, to run trials on that. But that is my thinking uh, based on uh, actual wear and experience myself and refining my understanding of how stays sit on the body. Um, I also have, uh, alongside that, thoughts on fit, uh, how they should actually feel when new uh, uh, to be sure that the pattern is correct. Um, and that would be relevant to if you've made a mock-up, uh, assessing the fit of the mock-up. I will um, talk about that a little, uh, another point in this video. Back to this apportionment of front to back. I am going to arbitrarily add two inches. Now remember we're working with halves, so I really only need to add one inch to the front. Now the bust is a little trickier. Um, uh, compression can work a little differently, but I, I suspect that there is a, a measurable reduction that she gets um, in her current stays perhaps not as squishy as the waist. Um, breast tissue is different from fat tissue. Considering the shape of the bust actually changes by being uplifted and supported from below in stays, she, she may well be getting an inch reduction, in which case I will add, add half an inch to the front on this pattern. Again, this is the bust and we have not drawn the curves in yet. So what we have here at the moment are a midpoint under the arm, underarm line, a bust line, a waistline. We now have a hypothetical, and this line is not going to, to, to need to match that. That line does not um, actually extend out in the final pattern. It's more important that I get a long line um, extending down as far as possible here. Okay. And Likewise, in the back, um, that would could usefully intersect with this line, so we will extend that slightly. Okay, so we're going for this. And I know from experience that this needs to be drawn somewhat long. It's going to need to extend quite high there. We're drafting those pattern pieces, so extended it right up to there. Okay. So, still to come are uh, uh, arcs, uh, determining sort of a high hip, which will help with the drafting of the arcs there. 
um, and then apportioning the body further for the for the four separate uh, pattern pieces. What I've basically done then is altered uh, what's uh, the measurement I'm seeking um, as of what's on my tape. So I need to sort of retranslate those onto this tape before using this tape to uh, f formulate the the arcs or the curves. Because um, remember, it's the curves that map out where the stays are actually going to fall. Uh, points of the body. So those curves need to be the correct measurement. And curves, of course, uh, you know, have a different measurement than um, a straight line does, or it's a different um, effect. So I need to translate um, these changes. I've added half an inch here. So now, AD at the hole. He's now got this added bit. And I think we will just translate that, that here and put AD revised. Okay, and now the waist, that was the original. We've added an inch this way, so this kind of needs to be the revised. And here. So this is AF revised and this is half AF revised. Let me just check that. Yes, perfect. Now, the effect of these stays needs to achieve a certain amount of support and compression relative, of course, to the actual measurements and, and uh, size and shape of the body. But we're going to basically draft these curves as they appear in the pattern. On this pair of stays, this is helpfully drawn out in this staged drawing, but this can also be double checked against the extant stays themselves. Uh, this is number 24 on page on here, um, and it's and it's through checking um, you know the fullest points of the body when these patterns are joined together. Um, if you were to uh, make a, a two scale um, exactly as they here as they are here, make these patterns and cut them out in paper and join them together so that you get a, a sense of the 3D shape of these stays, that tells you actually where. Um, the, the relative points of the body, the bust and the waist and the hips, um, are all sitting within that. Now remember these stays were drafted for an individual. These are not some sort of generic or um, idealized or standardized uh, pattern. The pattern details things like uh, the shapes and the length of the skirts. That is has to do with the fashion or the style of the stays. Uh, but the sizing can be identified through what these uh, look like uh, made up gives you a very good sense of the actual size and shape and proportions of the original wearer of these stays. So we are going to put full trust in the stay makers of the period. These are a particularly fine pair of stays. Uh, obviously the stay maker was very skilled, so we're going to put our full trust uh, that he knew what he was doing um, it, as far as his draftsmanship is concerned that this was the effect that was achieved on a person in the 1760s, 1770s, let's say the third quarter of the 18th century. Um, and so that is the effect we want on a body today, drafting. Uh, we want to achieve that as reflective of uh, the, the style, the fashion, and the silhouette, uh, and the way the clothing over these stays would have been worn. This gives us a sense of what our end goal is, that we are seeking to achieve uh, when drafting um, a pattern such as this on any person, regardless of their actual size, shape, dimensions, proportions, etc., etc. So we're going to go with that arc as well as we can, and then we will measure the actual curve, the line that results, uh, to adjust if necessary to determine exactly uh, according to the measurements um, that we want. Okay, 
So as far as drafting, I am relying again on some of the proportions of this pattern. And we are looking at uh, a curve, an arc, that is going to sit just a, a bit higher than half of this distance. I'm looking at this relative distance to here. Um, and it would seem that halfway would be approximately here. And I want a bit higher than that, but not a great deal. So if I aim for that, let's see how that will look. I'm going to go just a touch higher. I think I'm going to go with about there. Now, that becomes what is, this needs to be parallel. Remember this distance here, here to here. I put that here, then the front of the waist arc is going to be here. Now, the same applies to the back. And you'll notice that that intersection of that arc on that axis is much higher than the bust, the front of the bust. So again, I'm looking at the proportions of, from this horizontal line and this horizontal line. And I, let's see, that looks like that's about half. So that's about a quarter. It's going to be sitting just above three quarters. So let's see what we have here. Again, we have that underarm measurement that um, here to here. There's AM. I'm going to have another sense check there. It doesn't hurt to keep checking these things just in case you've inadvertently picked up the wrong line as you're measuring. Okay, I want to make sure these are less of a drop from the horizontal uh, in the back as in the front. So here we've got we've got about two inches, and here I've got um, one and about three eighths. So that seems like it's fairly um, proportionate in terms of how that arc is going to compare uh, on this portion of it and then it transitions to this portion. It's going to drop a bit lower in the center front than in the center back. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. We want this sitting as close to that line as possible and not too abrupt. I may need to take a bracelet off. And likewise here. And this needs to be pretty soft. Okay. I'm just using this to, to track the deviation to make sure that um, um, that the, the stronger angle of the curve does in fact sit up here um, before it drops away. So I'm aiming for this. You notice I'm not using any mathematical formulation um, I'm attempting to, to, to do it the way a fully trained, experienced period stay maker would do. Now, I don't have that training. I don't have that experience. Um, but I value that. And in my struggles to imitate not only what they did, but how they did it, it makes me appreciate just how much training they had, the apprenticeships they served, and any tailor who went on to specialize in stay making um, in any kind of population center where there was sufficient demand of business for them to specialize in that. Um, I don't want to undervalue um, that skill, that highly trained skill. Um, using different methods than we would tend to immediately, our go-to methods would be different today. Uh, it's a different world. Um, but the more that I try to do it, the way uh, the historical evidence indicates that they did it, the more I appreciate that. Um, I used to draw a lot as a child, so this is not particularly terrifying, um, but for a lot of people it is, and I get that. If 
Okay, just discovered that uh, the overhead camera and battery had died. So just going to review where we're at. That I used those two, two key points of that waistline and the arbitrary bust line. And I used that distance by putting that along the arc that I had drawn for the bust to basically map out points, dots, on uh, for the arc for the waistline. And then I could sketch them in gently uh, to join the dots. And I did that for um, both the front and the back. Um, so as you can see now, um, the, the curve is a little bit, it drops off, uh, it should drop off. Uh, just a touch more quickly on the front and it uh, drops a bit further lower down uh, than it does in the back um, so I can see that here I should probably have that more like that so that it hugs that straight line um, just a little closer a little longer a little further away from the vertical midline and then I can clean that up a bit just see if it looks okay that's that okay I'll check my notes for the next stage ah yes I need to very carefully determine exactly what the end point is end point is for each of these lines that it won't be the same as it is on the straight uh, we shall see so for the bust so AD is the front of the bust and I need to track this along as it curves And you can see it's actually gained a touch that this to this is the same as this to this. Okay, so this is actually coming out to here. Right, the waist, half the waist is A, F. Here we go. So we've got that to there. This needs to track along here and that has extended to there okay same with the back so that was AD stop and think about this we didn't revise any of this okay so AD is not revised in the back okay so oh yes it hugs the line a lot more here a little bit longer do this in smaller increments oh that looks a bit flat okay this bit showing again, 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 again. So it's here. Okay. And then the waist, same again for the waist. So here to here, right? Right. So now we follow that around. Sometimes tricky to not move it too much or too little as you come around. OK. 
Okay, I'm after this line here. Okay, so we can see here we've actually got a revision, a change. And perhaps that was just a case of I shouldn't have drawn these long lines so early in the game. I should have got these arcs in place first. That's okay, because I can see now what needs to be done. Thank goodness for erasers. And don't be afraid to use it. Eraser is your friend to enable you to do better, just like a seam ripper. So what's actually happened, if you think about this, stop and think about why these lines, the positions have changed slightly. I had added circumference on there to try to make allowances for how much um, compression there was in the measurements that I took with her already wearing stays. Um, These revised lines kind of reflect that a little bit, that in stays, she had more of a nipped-in waist. Um, you take the stays out of the equation, something closer to a natural body that has not yet been compressed, and that kind of hopefully returns you, returns your, your mapping out of the general di dimensions of the body, the, 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 the length and the circumference. Now you've got sort of a relatively clean say, a slate, so that as you draw in the pattern pieces that include darts, that means you are now drawing in the reductions again, but the reductions according to this style of stays, not the style of stays she was wearing when I took her measurements, um, which could have been could have looked very different. Um, that style uh, and how the seams were shaped with curved shaped darts to achieve that silhouette and that shape. Now we've got something here that we can map on um, this style uh, and the shaping that was given to each of the seams to give the silhouette of this, uh, this style of stays. But first we need to uh, carry on with the measurements um, to determine the, the width of the um, back pieces excuse me, the, the, the width across the, the front neckline above the bust. Um, and it's from that then we can, we can uh, shape out the, the armhole um, and then begin to refine the shapes of the pattern pieces. But doing this will um, finish mapping in the shapes, the measurements and proportions of, of the person's body. So that's what we'll crack on and do now is finish, uh, start working through this. Um, the instructions say once the lengths of the front and back, including the front and back peaks, ah, yes, I haven't done that yet. Let's get to that. Front and back peaks. This is a little bit of a negotiation between the style of the stays, so how much in the front, for example, at the waistline, how much further are you happy for that front peak to go? Um, that's partly a matter of the style of the stays, and that's partly the preferences of the individual wearing the stays um, uh, and what they're comfortable with. Um, so we, we see that people are wearing different styles throughout their lifetimes. Uh, some they may have found more comfortable than others, although all of them still fulfill the role of posture and support. Um, however, it, they almost inevitably, um, just, as, just as today with changing fashions, there are certain things you kind of think, ah, that suits me really, really well. Um, and, and that may then affect what you, what you say to your stay maker uh, for a new, a new style of stays, but you kind of, uh, uh, you might say, I'm, I really am not prepared to, for the, the peak to go that low or to stop that high. Uh, we just don't know um, 
how much for each of the surviving extant stays, how much of that individual's preference fed into the pattern that was drafted to make those stays. Uh, whether, whether we are seeing um, a highly fashionable um, ideal um, rendered into garments, or whether each and every pair of surviving stays that we can study today, um, it seems reasonable to expect that every single one of them reflects some input from the wearer. So, for determining the, uh, the length here of the, um, the peak um, as it carries on below the waist, uh, let me check whether we need to be doing the high hip curve just yet. So, so AI from this waist to here, that's going to be the top of the stays. And then we need to continue on down to find the peak. Now I've got notes here that indicate that the peak drops by three to four inches. So let me just check here. We have mapped up to find the center front top. Ah, we can find the center back top first. So we'll finish getting the, back, the, the top line and then Right. Now that strikes me as too low. Well, maybe not, maybe not. So this measurement is center back to waist. Okay. My notes on this are affected somewhat by my own preferences in stay making I'm for myself, so I need to bear that in mind. So it may be at mock-up stage that we'll determine to adjust the height of the back, uh, just as we might adjust the, the, the height of the, the front line. Um, so with, that, with those two points now, I'm going to need to establish some square, what we call squaring off. So from this line, I need to get that line across there on the compass, centered on that dot, and there. That is going to be a line. This won't be the top line. It will just be a guide, a guide point line. Okay, and then square off this that's on that that's on that okay I don't quite know yet how long these lines need to be that's fine so considering what that arm as I is going to look like that might be Yes, that might be, that, that looks about right for this style of stays. This is a pretty arbitrary number, um, kind of taken from the um, length of the peaks um, on the extant stays. I'm taking that as a feature of the pattern, although as I said, it might have had input. Um, from the wearer. So we're going to make the front peak down to there. Let me just double check that that seems reasonable. No, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Oh, this is a factor of measurement. Okay. So top to waist. What I'm after is AL. There we go. That's better. That's better. This was something that was taken with her input, asking her how how low she was happy to have that front peak come down. The same with the back. I've 
got a feeling I don't have the letter marked on it. So that's AG. Don't seem to have that. Let me see if it appears proportionate here. 1.8 Almost the same. Okay, so that's that's fine. So from the waist, I just need this really waistline to here. Waistline to here. Okay. And that looks about right. Yeah, that will effectively, because of again greater proportion on this side it will be a little bit lower on that side than here. Fine, okay. So that's the peaks. From the waist, we want to drop down an inch and three quarters. And this is the matter of the pattern that as to the length of the skirts, so the length of skirts, we've got th three and a half, three and three quarters, and these are notes again, the pattern of the, right, so this is effectively what we're working with for drafting this arc here. So this is going to be the start of what in recent years, people refer to the, the, the split of the tabs, but what this is, is the, the, end, the end point of the shaping darts that are on um, any seams here. It's as far down as that dart is going. So that's what we're determining here is. And I'm looking at that and thinking, this feels quite low, but I've got to remember it's a matter of scale. And this is a trickier cur um, arc because it's not running parallel to anything else. It's steeper in the front than it is in the back. Right, so here I need to focus my mind, in a sense, sort of step back and look at the bigger picture as to how that arc needs to appear. And as I've got various bracelets that interfere just a bit, I'm going to take that one off. What I've got is I need to go from this line to this line, mirroring that. So there's going to be a little bit more of a, it's going to be a bit of an arch there, and it's going to drop down. Again, as I did before, I'm just going to feather this in, and then start to look at how, what it looks like. Okay, I think I don't quite know where the recording um, overran its limits. Um, I think the pit that might not have been filmed is me continuing to work on reconciling the arbitrary measurements of the lengths of the peaks as taken from the extant stays in that pattern uh, versus the length of the peaks measured on this wearer and her input into how she wants that to feel and then taking into account then the proportions of the arc and I have moved it uh, higher um, bearing in mind that at this point that uh, needs to be um, one and one quarter inch uh, whereas the notes I had from the workshop indicated uh, that was a distance a drop of one and three quarters um, but one and one quarter actually seems to fit this proportion better. And then I've been able to make that curve. And that curve is going to be the line that the tops of the skirts take, where it the, the body of the stays open out into skirts that um, spread out over the hip. So that, that, that line does rise closer to the waist at the sides and does drop at the front and drop at the back. It drops more at the front than at the back, a little bit deeper. But that is that is reflected also in the in the comparative lengths of the peaks that the front is is sometimes just a touch longer. The peak in this case is possibly a little shorter for the wearer's comfort. Um, the back, we're going with the pattern. Don't think that she felt 
super strongly either way and this works for the kind of support on the back with the the way that peak and the and the, the uh, eventual skirts are going to splay over uh, the curvature of the of the buttocks uh, to spread the load um, to make uh, all the petticoats and any skirt supports more comfortable and those need to be sit in a particular place uh, just right uh, if they're going to do that job and be comfortable and that's again back to uh, that comes back to my theory that moving the center back or allowing it to shift in or out uh, with a narrowing or widening of the lacing gap to account for changes in weight uh, is not the way to go so <laughs> keep flogging that that horse that <laughs> that's that's uh, that's what I believe to be the case if anyone has a has a differing view I would love to get together and talk about that right so we are now where we can start to kind of map out the proportions of the four pattern pieces um, just determining kind of where they're going to kind of slice up uh, this pie if you like um, so I have squared off from the top of the center front uh, I need to determine that distance is a C on the tape Right, okay. Add half an inch to center back. Where is A, B? There we go. A, B is center back to the edge of the armhole. That seems quite, that's much too, I think I've got something mislabeled. That is not. Unless that's the bit width of the back and I want uh, that, but this might be it. Try that. see just done a little checking and shifted the I had um, kind of I don't know slipped something went wrong slightly with determining this point and then squaring off so I've just redrawn that um, I've also got just a little bit of uh, uncertainty in my notes about this portion so we'll just take this one step at a time but it's square off from the top of the center front across AC that's what I've done here add half an inch to center back okay square off the distance of AB okay so I had that slightly I'd squared that off too soon Draft the top line, determine the arm side front point. So it says one and three quarters from this. Two inches, that's right. Uh, this vaguely, vaguely rings a bell now. <laughs> Uh, 
this will be where the peak is. So I need a curve, a gentle curve here. And it kind of needs to be done again on a fulcrum sort of thing. So we've got a little bit of a rounded edge here. Not too sharp. arm hole needs to come something like this. Actually, from this, we can see this, it comes and hits this line and slightly raises up again. So we've got a little bit more depth to the armhole here, and then less there. Okay, I'm aiming for that point, actually. doesn't look too bad. I think it's that top bit I need to... Right, it looks like an armhole, an arm side. At this stage, that's all I'm gonna expect of it. Right, so now we need, when we apportion, That looks too wide. This is a definite measurement I've taken. That's a definite measurement I've taken. That that looks it looks like it should come over to here. It should look so good. Try that again. That's A B, isn't it? That's what it says. Actually, I think it's more, I might have drawn that in the wrong place. Hello again, thank you for sticking through this far. Don't worry, this was a natural break in the drafting process where I reached the point where I wasn't too sure what was going on with the width of the back. So I actually put the project away overnight and came back the next morning and thankfully was able to solve that and move forward. So stay tuned for part two.